Today are the top 20 pitfalls and mistakes for refugiums. Well, we wish somebody had told us day one, uh, wait, they did tell me, I applied it, it worked, then I forgot, I didn't, and <laughs> we're applying it again. So we go through that cyclical cycle, learn why you should do this from day one. Refugium mistake number one is missing the fact that a refugium is absolutely a heavy feeder's dream filtration method. I mean, like, there's no other filtration methods out there that it doesn't really matter how much food you put in the mm -hmm. tank. Uh, you're going to run really low levels of pollution, nitrogen, phosphorus, like uh, probably pretty close to zero. Uh, and uh, you can also tune it to be mm -hmm. kind of right where you want it. Uh, like uh, the skimmers, I'm going to do that for you. There's a limitation of mm -hmm. how much food I can do there. Uh, the filter socks going to have a limitation. Even the skimmer, uh, the carbon dosing, there's only so much I want to do with that. Like all of this stuff, and like even the carbon dosing could possibly be close to it, but it's still kind of like a black mystery box yeah. of exactly how it works and how to dose yeah, it. It's more work. Yeah. <laughs> or I could throw a ball of algae in the sump, throw a light on it, and be done. And it almost doesn't matter how much I feed, feeding is just not going to be my problem. Mistake number two is not picking a goal. You got two here. You can have no nutrients or no algae in your tank. And the reason they're different is depending on how much and how powerful your light is. If your goal is to have, you know, low nutrient levels, then you can power your refugium with something that's not super strong. It can be a little five watt light and you're going to do fine. But if your goal is to outcompete the algae in your display tank, then you're going to need a much more powerful light in your refugium. Uh, here's the reality of it. In all of our experiments that we run, even really fairly low wattage uh, uh, refugium lights will help you maintain really low levels of nitrogen phosphorus, pretty close to zero. Uh, like they don't have to be that powerful. And in fact, the number one uh, light that you guys are picking up is that tunes like Eco Chick from yeah, us. Yeah. Like a waterproof one. Yeah. Yeah. It's like not super duper powerful light, but it's really easy to put in a sump. It's waterproof. You can even put it like underneath the algae if you wanted to. Works great on a hang on one. Okay. That's probably why. And you're finding like really low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus because it's just sucking it out. It really doesn't matter how much you feed. Problem solved. Okay. But what if my real goal is I want to grow algae in the back and not the front, and it's not just limited to what my test kit says. Visually, I just don't want algae in the tank anymore and I want it in the back. Well, it's not reasonable to assume that if I had algae in the back and I got the power of the sun from all of what I'm doing, all my corals in there, that like somehow the algae is not going to grow there and it's going to grow in the back with my 12 watt LED. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't even make any no. sense when you say it out loud. Okay, so if I want that LG to grow in the back instead of the front, the lights in the back need to be as powerful as in the front. And that's why like some of the most successful solutions out there look like this, which is the Kessel uh, A360X Refugium. Uh, we're using the blade refugiums, but you can use uh, all kinds of different lights in there. You can use even freshwater lights mm -hmm. to some degree. Uh, there's gonna be a lot of spectrum in there that like it's kind of useless to the plant, but uh, I, you know, you can see it better, I guess. But you really want a high powered solution. Something about as high powered as the front and the back will not just reduce the nutrients, it will also reduce the algae. Refugium mistake number three, missing the fact that a refugium is one of the only, if not the only single solution to control nutrients. You have filter socks, protein skimmers, all these can do a decent job, but usually need to be in tandem with each other or with other things. But if you set up a macro algae refugium, whether it's a hang on the back and a sump, that can be the one stop solution to all your nutrient problems. I've seen people put enormous amounts of like uh, like uh, filtration on there. Like they're putting in canister filters, they're putting in uh, filter socks, they're putting roller mats and skimmers, and like combining the skimmers' performance with carbon dosing. And a lot of times they just can't even seem to figure out how to get to, to zero zero. And then there's the ball of algae throwing the sump, uh, turn the light on, and like now I did it. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 so missing the fact that this can be, and we say this in a lot of videos because we're really trying to drive it home because like it's really valuable for, especially if you're like a new to intermediate, intermediate reefer in those first couple of years, man, like these things can be the problem. Like, like why the tank looks like crap and it's filled with algae and you're embarrassed of it, mm -hmm. or it could be throw some algae in there. And the reason why Man, that looks awesome. Spouse looks awesome, says it's awesome. You think it's awesome. Everybody comes to your house, says, oh my gosh. They bypass your wife when they get there and they go straight to the <laughs> tank and say, that looks awesome. She's pissed off, but <laughs> the tank looks great. 
Mistake number four is assuming your refugium needs to be big, needs to be huge. And the reality is it doesn't have to be. You don't need a gigantic sump to accomplish this. In the testing we did, which was really powerful stuff, yes, a larger uh, refugium in a sump can get you near zero, zero, but a smaller hang on the back refugium does a fantastic job of keeping those nutrient levels down. Uh, in one test we did, we fed uh, cubomyces every single day, and after seven weeks, the control had no refugium, hit uh, like 70 parts per million of uh, nitrate, and the one with the hang-on fuge in the little low-watt light uh, was five, right? It's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I mean, it was really single digits, super low. So, I mean, it's a dramatic, dramatic thing. It's just this hang-on box of algae, so simple. Refugium mistake number five is missing the fact that this is actually the easiest to tune filter on your tank. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, you can turn your lights up or down or you can even turn them on or off. If you find that all of a sudden your nutrients are starting to creep up a little bit more, well, just turn the light up. Either run it for longer part of the day or if you can turn the power of it up, turn the power of it up. And the opposite is true as well. If you're sucking out too much, just turn the power down. It's all photosynthesis. Yeah. Like the higher the rate of photosynthesis, the more nitrogen and phosphorus is gonna be sucked out. Uh, and so this little knob here on the Kessel uh, A360X refugium uh, says intensity on it. But what it really should say is more nitrate and phosphate <laughs> or less nitrate right. and phosphate. Because the more light that you put on it, the faster the rate of phot photosynthesis. And then if you wanted to even get past this thing, oh, maybe I just turn it on every other day instead of uh, uh, just uh, every day. Mm -hmm. Or instead of an eight hour window, I turn it on for four hours. Like you just can't do that same no. like, super easy thing. Like carbon dosing, getting that dose right isn't the same. Uh, doing a, uh, a skimmer is never gonna be That's that way. Uh, the filter socks never gonna be that way. Like, more nutrients, less can be that easy. Mistake number six, forgetting the micro crustacean, especially the copepod value. Yeah, macro algae refugiums are great for nutrient control. You know, I think we've hit that point home pretty well by now, but they also provide a safe harbor for your copepods. I mean, if you're doing a really cool aquascape, something that's maybe NSA aquascape, then there's not a lot of places for those copepods to hide. They're gonna be continually picked off. But if you have a refugium, whether it's in the, in the back, you know, down, down below in a sump, it is going to provide so much habitat for those scopopods that will then, you know, at least a lot of the species can safely travel up your return pump and back into the tank. You know how I know that I got a really healthy uh, level of copepods? is because uh, I don't have diatom problems and I don't have algae problems because they're eating all those mm -hmm. little things at a microscopic level. We've actually watched it on the microscope. Also, like I tell you, like I've seen people who have really healthy refugiums and at night you can come bring a high powered flashlight oh, up yeah. and you'll actually see the like little swarms of them and yep. stuff. And, and, like, it is a, a totally different thing that if you don't have the refugium, you just don't have that safe haven. So just another kind of bonus. This was actually the reason that I did the refugium the first oh, yeah. time. I wanted a, 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 a mandarin. That oh, was yeah, the only course. reason I put that hang on thing on there. It just turned out to be the savior of my tank as well. Refugium mistake number seven, we already touched base on here, but it's assuming that a hang on refugium has no value. That is incorrect. It has a tremendous value, maybe not quite as effective as a larger area, but in the testing we did, we found it reduced nitrate levels, I think from 70 to five. And if you don't think that's valuable, that's crazy. Uh, in fact, if you go look at like your average, like 40 breeder or whatever, and like you got all this hang on gear mm -hmm. on the garbage on the back, if you just like put a refugium on there, man, they're probably going to be way, 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 way more <laughs> successful. True. And they're cheaper yeah. uh, as yeah. well. Uh, so uh, I, and like the skimmers, like make noise. And they just like little teeny skimmers just don't the gross work to clean. as well. Gross to clean. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I, so I, I don't know. Think about the hang on refugium in many cases if you can't fit it in there because it could be the solution you're looking for. Mistake number eight is assuming because there's not a dedicated spot in your sump that you can't have a refugium without doing some crazy working. You absolutely can, and it's really easy. And honestly, I just did this. There is this wonderful stuff. What's this called? Aquamesh. Aquamesh. And all you have to do, and all I did, was purchase this, cut it. You know, I use some big scissors. You can use a knife for it. Uh, cut it exactly. Maybe, maybe if it's, you know, if it's a 10-inch wide sump, maybe go like 11 inches so that it will really sit in there tight. 
and then just place it down. It's almost like dried spaghetti. So all of the water can pass through, but it will keep that catomorpha or whatever macroalgae you have in place. And then occasionally all you gotta do is just pick some algae off of there and you're done. If you can go look at your sump right now and say, hmm, is there an area where I could carve off at least what would account to like maybe like what a hang on mm -hmm. refugium would look like Small. and I could put a little light in there? You got a refugium now. Easy. Uh, this stuff creates a baffle, holds it in place, uh, really inexpensive, easy thing to do. And I actually did just exactly what you did, which is uh, I got a sump for my own tank, the 360, and it doesn't have a refugium in it. And so I didn't put one in there just because it wasn't in there, just like all of you do. Uh, and then like, you know what? Finally, like, screw that, man. And it is cut a piece of this stuff. And now there's an area for a refugium. I put a couple of those uh, AI blades on there, which mm -hmm. are nice because they don't have to be suspended above the tank. They can just rest right on the edge of the sump. Uh, now I have a refugium and like, I didn't have to settle for it just the way that it was. You can reconfigure your sump pretty easy. Refugee mistake number nine is chasing your pH problems with chemicals when all you might really need is just a ball of algae. It does a tremendous job. And I know like a lot of people, I light my refugium at nighttime and you can just watch on my apex. You know, when the lights go off, you can see the pH, you know, start going down. And then as soon as my refugium light turns on, it plateaus and sometimes it even starts going back up. Yeah, so uh, more pH buffer, more better, more pH, but no, that's a terrible idea. Uh, like uh, there's also like, let's run lines for my skimmer all mm -hmm. the way outside, but let's like make sure we don't do it anywhere where it's gonna suck up exhaust mm -hmm. from my lawnmower or anything like that. Uh, then it's also you know, head pressure now and the skimmer doesn't work as well. Okay, well then let's like use a CO2 media. Mm -hmm. let, 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 let's like all these crazy things. Or let's throw a ball of algae in the corner, man, throw a light on and call it a day. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, so what happens is just like in the tank is you're lighting the refugium and the refugium like plants require CO2, sucks out all the CO2 of the water, increases the pH of the water, which uh, in turn increases the pH inside of the coral. It calcifies faster. And for us, when we tested people running like 7.8 versus 8.3, they're gonna grow like 50% faster, more. man. Ball of algae in the corner. Yeah, that easy. 50% faster and not, that was just in our testing period. It's exponential. Mm. It, the, that 50% more growth is gonna do its own 50% more growth and so and so on and so on. This is the reason why some people are filling out their tanks inside of like, you know, a year, 18 months, and some people take five years. It's also why some people are just like littered with uh, coralline algae all over and some just can't grow it at all. So pH, super big thing in the tank. Uh, one of the easiest way to do it is a refugium. Mistake number 10 is getting dirty Kato. And what do we mean by dirty? We don't mean it has like oil and stuff on there. We're talking about pests, right? If you just have a buddy who wants to give you some Kato, that, that, that's great and all, you know, but oftentimes if you pull that out, you are gonna find all sorts of things. And oftentimes, you know what I find in there? The things that I hate the most, which I know are somewhat good for the tank, bristle worms. I can't tell you how many times I've pulled it out and been like, oh my gosh, there's so many in here. You get burned by those things <laughs> yes. too. Uh, uh, basically, you should, because it's well lit, uh, you should think every photosynthetic pest that's in that guy's tank will now be in my tank. Yep. Uh, and you don't want them all. Uh, and so uh, when you say clean, I'll say as clean as, as possible, possible yes. because I've never seen something that like, it's just like not realistic to assume that no, you'll yeah. never get any other organism in there other than uh, just the catamorpha. But the best possible solution I found is LG algae barn. barn. It's really clean. It is good. I've, I've used it. Okay. I just put it in my own tank. Yeah. I, I'll tell you the problem with it though, is that like, you know, like you guys buy a lot of it, so you can't produce it that fast. And so, you know, he's selling little teeny chunks of it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's trying to scale it up, but you guys just keep buying more of it. <laughs> uh, so the problem for me with the catamorpha and the refugium in general is how do I get enough catamorpha to get that like, Yes. Or like starter basis yeah. uh, for like my corals. Uh, and that's just one of the challenges is, is you're probably going to have to grow that little bit out in the beginning. Uh, and hopefully in the upcoming year, somebody's going to be able to sell you the same basketball size yes. of it that is pest free for the same price. But we're working towards that. Refugium mistake number 11 is thinking you can only use Catamorpha here. It doesn't have to be. Catamorpha works really well, mind you. It is really fast growing and sucks up a lot of nutrients, but 
not necessarily the most pretty just staring at this ball. There are other macro algaes you can use, and you can even use things like mangroves. Now, we'll talk about this a little bit later. You can build, you know, display refugium tanks, or you can add macro algae to your tank, but you can use other more pretty macro algaes instead of catamorpha. I think one of the ones that they have at, at LG Bar, like sea lettuce. They do. Uh, they also have like uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, Calerpa used to be real popular. Like Crassularia, yeah. like lots. So the problem with like Calerpa is it can like go sexual, which is sends out all the little spores eventually. And then- And you also like, can't get it in California, it's illegal. It's uh, like anywhere near the ocean is <laughs> yeah. actually pretty hard to get. In fact, like, I don't think you can even buy it on eBay because eBay bans no, it. No, you yeah. can't. Yeah, so like uh, the problem is, is like the reason Catamorph is so popular is because it stays put. And then even if it did make it into the display, it, you just pull it out. It's, it's so really easy. easy. I know. Uh, whereas uh, other types of algae kind of like tend to root. And then mm -hmm. once they're in, man, they're in. It's really hard to keep them in control. So you can try other algaes out there. Ask some questions before you do it. Refugium mistake number 12 is not realizing that your refugium can be things other than macroalgae. It can be other filter feeders. Even I've seen people put some like pulsing xenia in there. It can be some simple corals. It can be clams. It can be all sorts of filter feeders that will also suck up nutrients. I, I know a lot of people who like would like to uh, create a clam refugium because so cool. these things are kind of like carbon, man. They'll filter the water mm -hmm. for you. And that's like what they do all day. Uh, also like cryptic fuges where people will put like Sponges, uh, like didn't even have a light. It has yep. Sponges and things like mussels and clams and stuff in there, like uh, or bivalves and stuff in there. Uh, like in that case, or oysters. Uh, oh, you, know, you can put different things in there. You have to find ones that survive in seventy-eight degree mm -hmm. water. But uh, like you can do refugiums in so many other ways than just catamorpha and a light. Mistake number 13 is not realizing that a refugium can be corals. We already briefly mentioned this, but some corals grow really quickly and they suck up nutrients. So it can be something really cool like a coral. I didn't think about this, but like in my first tank, uh, man, I had a sheet of Xenia oh, growing up oh, the yeah. glass and every once in a while I just peel it all out. 100% that was like nutrient control. And like, <laughs> I'd leave the stuff at the bottom so they would like grow back up again, yeah. right? But like a whole pain just like pulsing at you. It was really mm -hmm. cool. Uh, but like, I'm absolutely uh, exporting it. So anything that grows really, really, really fast, like some zoanthids will grow fast, green star polyps, xenia, uh, like cinularia and some mm -hmm. soft corals and stuff like that. If you could make like a little frag tank, you know, and like, turn that into a refugium that grows cool. corals that also allows you to go to your fish store and trade out corals for free buckets <laughs> of salt and stuff. Uh, when all around, I'm better taking care of my tank. I got a new kind of cool display and I got a free bucket of salt. Mistake number 14 is if you have a new system, it's not establishing that refugium with pods. Yeah, oftentimes when you get corals or other things, they'll eventually make their way into your tank, but wouldn't it be better to just buy a couple bottles of pods, turn the flow off, pour the pods into the catamorpha, and then poof, you got your copepods. This was a catch-22 for me because in the past, I would have gone grab some catamorpha from my buddy, uh, and then for sure I got pods, man. Of course, no but, question. Well, but some other things too. Couldn't keep them up. Like, oh, no, no. <laughs> now I'm getting like clean keto. I'm not gonna say that clean keto is like free of pods, uh, but at this point, like, I wanna start the tank with pods. I, I always believed that the pods will populate on their own. You really couldn't stop them even if you wanted to. They're going to find their way into that tank. But now I believe wholeheartedly I want to start the tank with pods. Yes. So as soon as I set the refugium up, I'm going to put them in there. They're going to populate there. The more of them, the better. They're grazing on the diatoms. They're grazing on the microalgaes. It's just like the tank is just way better off when there's a healthy population. Refugium mistake number 15 is missing the value of flow. Now, this can be beneficial in a lot of ways, but the, one of the ways I think about it is I actually have a little gyre. It's picked up, you know, one of those inexpensive, you know, orangish looking gyres. And I just put it, for me, I just put it on the bottom, right? And I have it, you know, all the flow going this way. So I create these, these circle of flow. And what it does is it takes my catamorpha, which typically only gets, you know, the most of the light up here and how much, how, you know, how much is trickling down below but now it's actually tumbling in there and I'm probably getting way more nutrient uptake. It's a plant. It requires light, it requires CO2, it requires uh, like nitrogen and phosphorus. It's gonna pull that out of the water and stagnant water is not gonna provide a whole lot of that. 
Uh, it's, I don't find it super important to tumble it. I've had a lot of success without tumbling mm -hmm. it. If I could tumble it, would I? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I also haven't had the, the need to do it. But I do the same thing as you. I use that gyre jump and I shoot water across the bottom of it. And, you know, it might look like you're just kind of going in the same flow as the mm -hmm. sump but you're not because water that goes this way actually has to come Suck back it. to go back in it. So water's flowing through the catamorpha now uh, and, uh, and you're getting the CO2 to it. It's going to perform better at the pH function because totally. it can suck it out. It's going to pour out more nitrogen and phosphorus as well. So uh, like every living organism, like in the tank, it's not just a light, it's a flow too. The algae is the same. Refugia mistake number 16 is not replacing the elements that the macroalgae uses. Now, that's why we have something here. This is what I use. I buy it in the big like two liter things because I go through so much of it. Cato Grow by Brightwell Aquatics is fantastic. There's also one. Uh, core 7. Core 7, yeah. An, an, another great option as well. But the reality is, is we're used to growing corals in our tanks. And for those of us who macroalgae refugiums are new, we don't realize that uh, uh, living, breathing, you know, algaes here have different needs and something like Cato grow dosing it will really make it flourish and grow faster. Here's the problem is we are growing algae now in the back on purpose and harvesting and throwing the trash. And what it does is it's sucking out elements of the water, sucking out magnesies, uh, yep. molybdenum, iron, all these, things. Yeah, these things are important for the rates of photosynthesis and controlling them. Uh, okay, well, it turns out inside the coral, there's a thing called zooxanthellae that also needs those things. So when we strip them all out, uh, well, there's not buff for the coral. Mm -hmm. the, all of a sudden, the macroalgae is not going to work as well. The coral is not going to work as well. So uh, things like Cato Grow can actually replace those things. Now, the one that you mentioned, Core 7, this is a two-part from Triton. So the Core 7 is your basic you know, two-part that has all the trace elements and stuff in there. But on top of that, it also owns the fact that you have a refugium. It's built for you That's if you great. use a refugium and adds in extra things like molybdenum and yep. Tantium, uh, uh, yep. uh, the iron and all that stuff. Okay, and this is the reason that they do it differently in that case. Because in a normal like two part, what they're doing is they're providing those things. They know that the, the, the zooxanthellae is gonna pull all these things out too, but they're usually tied to calcification rates. Yeah. yeah. So like it provides energy, to, you know, pulls those things out, drives photosynthesis, provides carbohydrates, glucose, glycerol to the uh, the coral. Coral grows and then pulls out calcium and uh, alkalinity from the water. These things are all kind of interlinked with each other. Okay. The problem with the the catamorpha in there is it doesn't calcify, so it's pulling out all those things but it's not tied to yeah. uh, calcium alkalinity uptake. And that's why they're elevating it in this case. That's why I wouldn't use Core 7 if I didn't have a refugium. But if you do have a refugium, to be frank, it's the only one I'd use. Mistake number 17 is just a little bit of laziness and not harvesting. Now, the, the way refugiums work is, yes, something like catamorpho will absorb a lot of those nitrates and phosphates, but then how do they get out of the tank? If you don't harvest them, eventually it's just going to break down and it's going to go back into your system. So you need to make sure you're pulling out chunks of that catamorpho so that you're pulling out chunks of phosphate and nitrate. With a uh, good flow, you'd be surprised. Like it creates a big mat in the bottom and you'd be surprised that the bottom of it is like actually as healthy as the top of it in most cases. Maybe not quite as bright, but it's still very healthy. Uh, but if you break it out, it's like all crumbling and mushy and the stuff. Uh, that just became its own nitrate farm again. Mm -hmm. So like you don't want all that stuff decaying in the water. So, you know, make sure you're harvesting enough that the bottom isn't decaying in that way. Mistake number 18 is not making adjustments once you hit that zero, zero mark. Well, what do we mean? If you put your uh, macroalgae refugium in a tank that has, you know, relatively high nitrates and phosphates and you're using it to reduce those numbers, well, once you get to those numbers you want, which oftentimes is zero, zero, if you have a refugium, not for other instances, but if you have a refugium, then if you leave the light on the same amount, you might actually start starving things like your coral. So what will you need to do? You'll need to make adjustments to your light, whether you turn the intensity down or change the lighting period. All right, so walk you down a story. I got 50 different or 50 parts per million nitrate. I turn this thing to 100% uh, and then all of a sudden I have zero. Okay, well now every day, I'm actually only adding like a half a part per million nitrate and I'm not dealing with, you know, 50. So I can maybe turn this thing down to like, you know, 20% mm -hmm. if that was my only goal. So yeah, this is definitely an adjustable filter and there is a difference between where you're starting and where you're going. 
Mistake number 19 is overlooking a reactor or a scrubber as an alternative. Now, there are instances when maybe you don't want a hang on the back refugium because it just doesn't look as nice. Or maybe you just don't have the sump because you have other piece of equipment that you want in there. Well, there are other good options. You can externally plumb some sort of reactor. You can buy these pre-made or you can DIY one yourself and just wrap some LED lights around it and, you know, put a little pump on it. And there you go. You have a reactor. Or you can do something like a turf algae scrubber. Yeah, sometimes they can be a little bit more spendy, but they do a fantastic job. They contain all the algae in a small area and you can usually just put them above your sump. Yeah, so algae scrubber is cool for one really good reason. Remember all that clean Kato stuff we were talking about mm -hmm. and the problem of obtaining, you know, clean Kato in a like a quantity mm -hmm. large enough? Well, this thing actually grows off of just uh, basically hair algae. It's amazing. It's, yeah. it's magic almost. <laughs> yeah, you just turn the lights on, all of a sudden the thing just starts growing sheets of hair algae mm -hmm. on it and you just take it out and scrape the hair algae off and throw it away. I don't need to source algae anymore. Uh, now, obviously there's the thing I have to like clean the screen every week or so, but like uh, this might be a much more compact, easy solution for many people. Uh, the only reason I like the refugium better is because it's so simple, but uh, maybe simple isn't the goal in this case. I just want a lot of clean, you know, algae that I didn't have to source or uh, get out of somebody mm -hmm. else's tank. This thing is like a catch-22 for me. Like, <laughs> this is for gear junkies, especially that cool, like, Pax Bellum one. Yeah, oh, right? it's, 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 it's fancy looking. It's beautiful. I've had one. Uh, but, like, now I got all these bolts and stuff, and it's in there and out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, I don't know when to harvest it and stuff. And uh, it definitely works. It's just, a, like, more work than just growing it in an open area mm -hmm. with the light. So there better be a really good reason. And don't pick Gear Junkie as the only one. It's like, I only have space for it. This is the right tool for the job then. Refugee mistake number 20 is using an underpowered light. And this is actually my first tank, which was a Red Sea Reefer 170. It's a mistake I made. I set up a refugium. I went to, I think it was Home Depot at the time, and I just bought a little clip-on light with a bulb because that's how I'd seen some people do it on YouTube, and it seemed to work fine. I, I, I could accomplish nothing. Like, honestly, my macroalgae barely grew and I was certainly not out competing the stuff in the display tank because the light was underpowered. You need a more powerful light to really, you know, supercharge your refugium. Yeah, my experience is it will grow. It just like goes really slow. Slow. And yeah, like it's not out competing anything. You might reduce the nitrates. And not, I mean, this is like where that conversation started. Like back in like the 52 weeks of reefing mm -hmm. series, like we kind of talked about, it. I was like, well, you know, if you put that on there, maybe you could reduce the nitrate and phosphate like 25%. It's, I don't know, maybe that sounds like a lot or a little to you, but that means to me, one less water change, uh, you know, or yeah. one less piece of equipment I need to buy or whatever. Uh, but then we would later find out if you power it right, then like it actually replaces all of it, uh, <laughs> you know, in some cases. Uh, so yeah, like power the light right. And in fact, those little fluorescent balls that I got from the hardware store, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're like white lights that if you like read the spectrum on it, far from optimal yeah. for this. Uh, it just wasn't designed for this purpose. And so now you're seeing these like refugium lights and stuff come from people that design lights for the purpose like of horticulture. horticulture. Yep. Yeah, so Kessel like specializes in horticulture as well uh, and sells, you know, like uh, a lighting to the hydroponic industry where like growing like plants is, you know, profit or no profit. <laughs> and, yes. and they're using these things. So that is like you design the light to a specific purpose with the right spectrums and that's what it does. Like this video? Well, we produce more of them every week. In fact, many of them. So subscribe right here. And our best of mistakes playlist right here.